Life is plastic art. Um, when we contemplate uh, this age of ours in which uh, genomic science and powerful forms of biotech are ascendant, I think we have to contemplate the possibility that life is on the verge of becoming yet another form of plastic art. Um, I mean, in large part, that life is on the verge of becoming fundamentally uh, malleable. I'll try to, as I make my way through this talk, um, explicate a bit there, give you a better sense of what I mean. But I'll give you a sample. Since the human genome was sequenced, the scientists and the instructions for the structure and every component of every cell in the body at their disposal. Occasionally, within these instructions, errors or changes to gene sequences can arise, which may cause disease. But investigators have lacked a practical and precise way to edit gene sequences to treat and potentially cure disease. That is, until now. CRISPR is a precise genome editing tool which enables scientists to work inside cells and make specific changes to genes. It is a two-part system comprising a single guide RNA which directs the Cas9 nuclease to cause a double-stranded break in the matching DNA sequence. When Cas9 cuts the DNA, it triggers the cell's natural repair enzymes to fix these breaks. It's during this process that the target gene can be modified by adding to, disrupting, or changing its genetic information. Or instead of rewriting the gene sequence itself, different types of CRISPR can be used upstream to switch genes on or off. By simply altering the composition of the guide RNA, different precise locations within the genome can be targeted. AstraZeneca is in. Let that one go just a second or two too long. Um, no disrespect to Bill or uh, our corporate friend there um, when I say uh, fascinating and beautiful video, but also rather obscure, right? Um, somewhat, uh, to put it mildly, arcane. Um, I can't imagine that many people, um, most of whom in this country and most others don't have a technical training, would be any wiser about what CRISPR is by watching this beautiful bit of quasi-science fictional advertising. Um, so CRISPR is a, a profound technology, absolutely earth-shattering already, even though it's just a few years old. Um, but it's, again, arcane and conceptually abstract. And this is really problematic. Uh, technologies. Uh, and applied science with the potential of uh, this type of radical biotech, uh, they're things that um, constitute um, really complex social uh, problem spaces, right? We really need to talk about this as a society before we embrace them. And that's not to say that, um, you know, I'm, so, I'm a uh, profound um, doom and gloom type. I just mean that there's serious implications um, underneath uh, the, the science here. Um, there's several that I'll run through, and I'll start with um, the, the one that usually pops up to the top of my list. All right, we, we really need to talk about the possibility that perfectly malleable life forms suggests a, uh, a possible world in which uh, life is uh, denigrated, right? It's degenerated down into a state in which um, we begin to think of life forms that have been uh, radically manipulated as just uh, just things, just objects. I had serious moral implications there. I'm a lawyer by training as well, so I'm also concerned about the potential that uh, fundamental aspects of constitutional law will be troubled by this type of technological uh, development, this new form of scientific knowledge and application. The vast bulk of uh, constitutional law, certainly in this country, but also in many other developed um, countries, Western countries generally, um, the vast bulk of it is premised on the notion that, uh, in one way or another, humans are created equal. And I wonder what it will mean for constitutional theory, much less for uh, applied uh, constitutional principles, 
if we move into a world in which more than a few humans are actually uh, not created equal, they're simply created by other humans in large part. Ditto for a, um, another possibility. Um, and again, uh, I hope that uh, Bill does not feel like I'm sliding his talk at all um, by saying that um, you, it's not a big stretch to imagine that um, in this world of ours that is um, increasingly essentialist in its politics, um, tribal in its outlook, um, and um, in my opinion, um, somewhat barbaric um, at, most, uh, at most social activities. It's not a big stretch to imagine that uh, CRISPR-like technologies could be used to inscribe, to inscribe attributes uh, at the genomic level. Um, attributes that align with socially constructed notions of ethnicity and race. Um, we've certainly seen activities um, of this type uh, attempted before. We'd have to go back to uh, perhaps to national socialism to get a, a really robust sense of it. But we know that these things are possible and that humans have tried to do this before um, and in living memory. Very complex technology. Uh, it's absolutely imperative that we talk about this as a society before we embrace it. Um, most of the, the experts who uh, really, really understand the nature of this, uh, this science and this, these new technologies as well are um, also invested in specific types of jargon all right, that prevent or at least make it very difficult for uh, non-technical um, uh, would-be understanders to make their way into it. When you add all of this together, if you're concerned about societal implications, you should be concerned about uh, radical biotechnology. Now, some, some of my colleagues um, feel that there's some, some hope to be had uh, when we look at science fiction, because uh, most people, even the casual sampler of the genre, know that um, it's wrestled with uh, the implications of uh, manipulable uh, life forms, uh, what I'm tonight calling uh, radical bi biotechnology in very rich and really quite provocative fashion in novels and in film. So certainly, um, Aldous Huxley in the 1930s with uh, Brave New World. Um, for those who are really, really uh, big science fiction heads, people who have read too much science fiction, you probably know about Cord Wainer Smith as well. Um, excellent, excellent writer, still unfortunately somewhat uh, obscure in um, broader popular culture, but uh, much of his corpus from the 50s into the early 70s addressed, um, addressed radical biotechnology's implications as well. Um, chiming on to and resonating with, I hope, Cherie's uh, uh, talk, um, Octavia Butler as well uh, has sampled this area, explored it richly in the 1980s. Most of my, uh, my technical colleagues point to a film from, I believe, the, 19, the late 1990s, Gattaca, as a, a rich source of uh, this type of exploration. And more recently, uh, I believe Oryx and Crake, uh, uh, Mrs. Atwood's work, um, was published in 2003, we, we get a, um, a rather uh, sobering and quite, um, quite apocalyptic vision of what full-on uh, radical biotechnology applied in a society who does not give it enough forethought uh, might look like. Uh, incredible, incredibly disturbing images of uh, horribly and horrifically sublime depictions of animals that have been converted into, I'm really not sure what to call them, um, efficiently optimized consumer biologicals, right? They're certainly not animals um, in any kind of normal sense anymore. Fascinating work. If you haven't read it yet, you should go out and get it, first in a trilogy, I believe. H.P. Lovecraft's work does not often um, get mentioned in the same breath as these, these others that have explored um, again, CRISPR-like technologies um, from a societal level, the implications of its application um, in, in those societies, in other words, not often mentioned in the same breath is 
uh, Cthulhu and the, the old gods that Lovecraft introduced us to. But I think uh, that should change, especially if we're thinking about the significance of these technologies, again, applied technologies for uh, marginalized communities of color. I'm going so far as to say these days that um, many of those communities, particularly um, African-American communities, um, are already living in a kind of science fictional space, right? And one that's not, um, not very far off the mark from what H.B. Lovecraft described to us in his, his works, um, many of which were really quite racist, misogynistic, um, and certainly, certainly monstrous. Uh, there's no time to really go into the details of, of what I mean here, um, and much of this won't be uh, a surprise to anyone, but uh, the radical forms of uh, ghettoization, toxic infrastructures, um, certainly anti-black racism, the new Jim Crow, and so on and so on. Um, I'm these days making an argument that um, the Anthropocene is certainly um, fascinating in a, in a terribly disturbing way, but for these types of questions applied to communities of color, and again, to, to black communities even more precisely, I think it's time that we start talking about the Cthulhu scene. Um, this is a spin on Lovecraft. Um, I'm also uh, nodding to, uh, to Donna Haraway, who uh, kind of offhandedly um, with no small amount of genius is, is often the case where they just kind of threw this term out and kept on walking. Um, and to try to write a little bit about it uh, this year as well, the Cthulhu scene, you should, um, you should check it out. So it's not uncommon, right? It's not uncommon for science fictional works to be used to explore and describe uh, techno-scientific problems and possible futures. This is nothing new and uh, not just in our libraries. Right? Uh, corporations have, uh, have turned to this, uh, this genre in order to uh, quicken the imagination of their employees, to give them a better sense of what the future could hold for them. Um, doing everything from, on the one hand, straight ahead forecasting to, uh, to the development of science fictional proto, uh, prototypes that uh, help them uh, pre-imagine the arrival, if you will, of uh, services and goods that they're contemplating. There's a, there's a point at which, though, science fiction used in this way becomes really quite problematic in my mind. And now I just want to extend that rather hefty list of uh, ethical issues that I, um, that I mentioned a few moments ago. Um, I think that these are, are genuine ethical uh, matters that I'm about to bring up, um, but ones that have received very little attention so far in this effort to, in effect, instrumentalize uh, science fiction. So I feel that it's, um, that it's important that we call out uh, commissioned science fiction um, as soft propaganda. Right? The idea that works um, of fiction uh, might be um, uh, literally commissioned in order to shape the imagination of the public or to give them, give us, I guess, is a more accurate way to put it, to give us um, some sense of uh, what we should be wanting uh, without explicitly calling work out um, in this fashion. Uh, it's troubling, it's troubling. Um, at best, um, soft propaganda, in my opinion. That's a serious problem that we need to, uh, to talk about. At the opposite end, um, there's a textual interpretation problem, right? Like, uh, one of the things that the, the post-structuralist turn tried to teach us was that um, texts are, uh, I guess to, to use a biotech-ish phrase, um, they're pluripotent. Right, they're polyvalent, they have uh, many potential meanings. And if you don't control the context in which you deliver a text, you uh, shouldn't bet much money on um, what the interpretation, what the reader's interpretation of that text will be. All right, so cash value there, even if you do commission a work of science fiction in the hopes of shaping people's brains, once they sit down with it and read it, if you're not right there with them in one form or another, um, all bets are off on what they take away from it kind of the opposite of the first problem. There's also, though, a, a literary ethics problem. And here, 
um, what I'm getting at is that uh, those of us who are friends of science fiction probably ought to be a bit concerned with appropriation of the genre to do much of anything. This is the old art for art's sake um, argument in, in a new form, I guess. Um, I'm wondering uh, a lot these days about what we can do to, uh, to protect the genre from uh, rough appropriation of this type. And one of the things that I've done, and you can see this in the, the artwork that's exhibited over here to your right, to my left, against the wall. Um, also, this, this work is on display in a reception venue. And those of you out on the internet, if you want to see it, you can Google, uh, Google the, uh, the center trip. Um, and I'll show you the spelling in a moment. But this, this work gets at this idea um, that I'm trying to express here. It's a rather complex one. Um, but the idea is, what, what would we have to do, actually, to inoculate science fiction against those types of appropriation? Uh, with Center Trip, I've, I've tried to introduce um, high art markers to make science fiction look more like uh, the types of things that we see in museums. Uh, Center Trip is a combination of an ancient poetic form called the Cento. Um, I can tell you more about that um, in the reception for those that are viewing online. The Cento is a nearly 2,000-year-old uh, poetic form that was used by early canonical Christians to fend off appropriations of um, biblical text. Um, it combines the Cento form with the triptych, which is also uh, an, a rather ancient form. Um, and then the final bit, uh, the so-called cover of Cento Trip, is a function of random machinic art. Um, there's a description of this online. Those of you that are present, um, really eager to get your thoughts about this and to talk to you about it. Um, here is what the, uh, the work looks like uh, overall. A triptych with a cover, right? Machinic art is undergirding the, uh, the red image there. And that's how that image is, uh, is produced, randomized machinic art. Uh, the three panels uh, constitute the, the three elements of the triptych. And um, it's my partial answer to this question of what lovers of science fiction should, should do to protect the genre in this climate. Thank you.